Good morning. I am so excited to be here uh, with you today. I've been hearing for years about the great work happening here in the heartland, and I was really excited to finally have a chance to come meet you, see what you're doing, talk to you. Um, because I think what you're doing here in South Jersey is important, not just for the people in South Jersey. I think you're really onto something here. I think you're onto something that could have profound implications for communities across the country. My organization, the Forum for Youth Investment, works with communities across the country to make them great places for families to raise children which means we have the best job in America. We get to travel across the country meeting amazing people like you who are really trying to come together and make your uh, community a family-friendly, a youth-friendly community and what that means. And so what I thought I would do today is come with, uh, talk about a little journey that we all have been on together. We all, the communities, working to become great places to grow up in, great places for families to raise their kids in, um, and kind of talk about what I think we've learned overall through the journey through the years. And I want to do this because where the journey lands, where it comes out, is very much aligned with what you guys are doing here. So to start with, people have been working to try and figure out, all right, how do we break down what that means to be a good community to raise children in? And I'm going to kind of give a couple lines of thought uh, both research and practice as people really struggled with that to try and understand it. Why, uh, why do some kids make it and other kids don't? What's behind that? I'm going to start by talking a little bit about a type of research it's called resiliency research, where you take young people who are in very difficult situations and some manage to still make it out okay while others don't. And so this research really tried to zero in on what is that magic trait or that magic skill or that magic competence inside of you that allows you to succeed in the most difficult situations. And when I say difficult, I mean difficult. Uh, the research looks at uh, children who've lost parents, children whose communities were wiped out by Katrina, children who lived up, lived, uh, grew up in war zones. And so they wanted to figure out what is that magic thing that people, even in those dire situations, why do some of them succeed? Take a minute just to think for yourself what do you think that might be? The answer they found out is there is no one magic trait. There is, in fact, a beautiful thing about this research which shows that. Humans, by nature, are remarkably resilient. We're born resilient. And generally, any one thing, even one of the horrific things I talked about, that alone will not be enough to derail you um, on your journey. However, there isn't one magic thing. What they found that what makes different people resilient are different types of things that different people have. Okay, and so that connects to the whole child approach. You can't pick one thing and say, this is what we're gonna zero in on. You really have to equip young people with a broad set of competencies, a broad set of skills that they can then deploy and that and allow them to be successful over time. All right, so if there's no one magic thing in a kid that you can train towards, what's then the magic program that we need to put in place in every community across the country. That program that young people go to it and they are going to come out the other side doing okay. There have been lots of evaluations of such programs over time. And if you're a researcher or you're looking at the research, it can be pretty disheartening. Most of the things that people do and try, and when you're in those programs, you are convinced they work when you actually do the tough research. It turns out that that program, in isolation of everything else that's happening in a child's life, is not enough to turn their life around. Some have no effect at all. 
A number of them do have statistically significant changes. It nudges you in the right direction. But is that nudge going to be enough to predict that you're going to be able to succeed and get to the point you want to be as a person? It doesn't. I'm not going to leave you on the, uh, the depressing note. There will be an upswing, I promise you. <laughs> so there's no one magic thing in a person. There's no one magic program that they all can be. The breakthrough came when we looked at flipping the script. Maybe we were asking the wrong questions. Maybe we shouldn't have asked what the one thing in a person in isolation of everything else in their life is going to get them to succeed. Maybe we shouldn't have been asking what's the one program or curriculum that in isolation of everything else in their life is going to get them to succeed. Maybe instead what we should have been asking is what are the full array of skills and competencies that young people need and what are the broad array of things that the family needs around them in a community to succeed. So this is where you would have the upswell of music, place on the journey where maybe you've been walking and now you see kind of like a clearing and maybe kind of glimpse at the summit and you think, oh, maybe, maybe we could actually get there. Some researchers refer to this as nothing works, but everything might. Any one thing might not work, but if you do lots of things together, maybe collectively, that would work. So let's take a look. Uh, body of work came out looking at risk factors. What are the different risk factors, negative things that could be happening in the family, happening in the community that surrounds the, the family, that negative things that could be happening inside of the, the young person themselves, risk factors in your community, your family, your school, your peer groups. And just count. Because we know not one of these risks is going to mean you're not going to succeed. But let's count. What if you have lots of these risks? Are you not going to succeed? Is that going to predict where you are able to get out? And that turns out to be remarkably true. And those risk factors tend to be the same, whether you're trying to avoid substance abuse or delinquency or teen pregnancy or school dropout or violence. It's the same four set of things, risk factors, that can set you in a wrong direction. And so this um, you can reflect on in terms of the collaboration, right? In a community, you might not need one youth violence prevention program and another teen pregnancy prevention program and another school dropout prevention program. You might just need a way to support young people holistically. And that's going to take care of a whole lot of those negative outcomes at once. Third, what if we instead of talking about risk factors, what if we talk about good things in a community, good things in a child's life? Once again, there was no one good thing in a community, one good thing in a family, one good thing in their child's life that could predict whether they're going to do okay or not. So they instead said, let's count. Let's count how many good things are in the kid's life. And what you get here, if you're a researcher, is researcher Nevada. This is the correlation you want to see, a direct line. The number of assets you have, the number of good things in your life, if you have 25 or so good things going on in your life, the odds are you're not going to go to have one high-risk behavior. As the number of assets you have in your life go down, the number of high-risk behaviors goes up. So this gives us something we can do now as a community. We can think through what are the holistic sets of supports and opportunities that we need to, um, uh, to put in place. And I don't have a slide in this, in this deck, but I want to let you know that not only do these assets help you avoid negative outcomes, they also predict wonderful good outcomes. They predict whether you're going to finish school, whether you're going to be able to grow up and be a good caring parent, whether you're going to be able to, to uh, make a living to provide for your, your family. So that's good news. However, how do you go about that? There is no one organization or institution that can by themselves do all of those assets. And so you need to do is form some sort of collaborative approach 
to provide those opportunities. How many of you are involved in some sort of collaboration? How many find that collaboration a very easy thing? I want your collaboration referred to as an unnatural act performed by unconsenting adults. <laughs> it does certainly feel that way um, at times. And I wish, I wish we had found an answer that didn't require collaboration, because man, wouldn't have that been easy. But we haven't found it. And what we found is you need a lot of things. You need a holistic approach, and so you need a lot of people around the table to do it. So that brings us to, all right, how do we form effective collaborations? Um, maybe five years or so, uh, a paper came on the scene about uh, called Collective Impact that took the philanthropic community and others by storm. And it laid out that for some social problems, and they looked at a wide range of ones, children, youth being one of these types of social problems, you need a collaborative in order to get to that goal. What they were bold about, which I think was really helpful, is they were also upfront that most collaborations fail. And those of us who had been supporting collaborations had tended to be like, champions, go collaborate. They did a good service, I think, to all of us to say, but you also have to tell people most of them fail, and we really need to get a lot closer looking at why some succeed and why some don't. Um, I'll mention the characteristics that they tended to find in their work. So um, collaborators that have a common agenda, that have shared measurement systems, they have mutually reinforcing activities, continuous communication, and backbone organization, meaning a lead convener organization who is doing the nuts and bolts of getting people together and developing the agenda and helping to facilitate the interactions. Um, among people. So summing up the research is transforming young people's lives, it's impossible to do within the bounds of a single intervention unless that intervention is not really a single program, even a fairly comprehensive one, but instead it's a reasonably complex strategy to change young people's environments. That's great, but being a reasonably complex strategy means it's gonna be reasonably complex to pull it off. Coming together to create a system of support for young people is antithetical to the way organizations are structured, is antithetical to the way government systems are structured. And so we have this difficult task of how you get from the tangle of stuff that's available to the right things that a community needs. So that brings us to complexity science, and I know it has the word science in there, but hang with me, it'll hopefully make some sort of sense. Which is this. There is also no one perfect set of things in a community that's gonna be right for all the kids in that community, right? We can't go in and say, all right, community, here's the list, to do these 17 programs, and it's gonna work out. There are types of problems that you can have that type of prescriptive solution to. This is not one of them. And complexity science says that when you are dealing with an issue where there is no one predetermined solution that you can put into place, you have to think about a different way of doing things. And that, to me, is where we come to the beautiful wisdom of families. Parents don't say, oh, I gotta figure out, I'm only gonna support one free. I really just want you to have grit, and if you're failing in school, if you're not eating healthy foods, don't worry about it, I'm just gonna focus on one thing. And they don't also say there's one magic program. Oh, well, I don't care if we are in a failing school system. I don't care if uh, you, there's a big pressure to join gangs just so you can get to and from school easily. There's a great after school program and that's all I'm gonna focus on, right? Communities, so our parents, families, 
get that this stuff fits together and they get that, you have to look at the broad range of ways that your young person is developing, the broad types of supports that are available in the community and the interconnectedness of them. So I think what you guys are doing here, I think there's an elegance and a beauty in how you go in and start with the families. You hear from the families. They are the ones who have the perspective of the wide range of things happening in that young person's life and they're gonna be the only people who can help you chart a path to get from where you are to get to where you want to be. And so, in closing, I am thrilled to have some time to get to know many of you. I think the things that you're learning and experimenting and testing are exactly the types of things that our country needs to hear about. And so I'm going to be taking copious notes. I encourage you all to take time to document what you're doing, what's working, what you're trying, what's not working, because I think you have really important stories that will be important for the country as a whole to hear from. Thank you.